there was nothing like the camaraderie of being with a bunch of other uh, college students or post-college left-wingers and uh, beatniks and just digging the Marx Brothers. It's the Marx Brothers Council Podcast, episode 26, The Marx Brothers in a Nutshell, in a Nutshell. We're going to discuss the celebrated 1982 documentary, but first, let's get acquainted. This is Noah Diamond, the stockbroker of yesteryear, the stowaway of today, virtually flanked, as always, by my co-hosts. You just rub a lamp and they appear. He is the researcher, editor, kibitzer, and philosopher responsible for hosting a third of our episodes, editing all of them, and from what I understand, someday he even plans to listen to them. You loved him as the manicurist in A Night at the Opera, Mr. Bob Gassel. Hi there, everyone. And uh, I'm here as long as we're not defunded. <laughs> and he is the author of Groucho Goes to Egypt, Annotations Are a Conspiracy, and Jane Austen, Her Novel Insides. He is the founder of the Marx Brothers Council. He found it behind the dresser. And the man responsible for bath marks and other Marxian phenomena, past, present, and future, Mr. Matthew Conio. I won't speak until I see my lawyer. <laughs> well, here we are, guys, to discuss the seminal 1982 documentary, The Marx Brothers in a Nutshell. And in just a little while, we'll be bringing out our two guests who are the two guys on Earth most qualified to talk about that documentary. But before we bring out the qualified people, uh, maybe <laughs> here we are. our <laughs> listeners would like to listen to we three bums kick it around for a while. Uh, what are your impressions? We've all seen this in the past, but we've just recently uh, caught up with it and watched it a few times recently. What do you think? I haven't seen it in decades, and I was very surprised when I uh, watched it because it became clear to me how well done this was because it appeals to fans all across the spectrum. You know, for the newbie, it it. it tells the story of the Marxes, it entertains them, it shows everybody how funny they were. But for the hardcore fan, there's all these rare clips and interviews that are, that are going to draw them in. So, you know, there's something for everybody here. Yeah, I was thinking how we often talk about uh, which Marx Brothers movie would be the best one to show to somebody who doesn't know them as an introduction. Um, it's a little bit of a cheating answer to say this one, but it would be an excellent overview for a newbie. And you're right, there's lots of obscure stuff to keep the fans interested. Was was this the first place you ever saw things like the theatrical agency, uh, House the Shadows Built Short, or some of the newsreel stuff of Chico and W.C. Fields? Definitely, in my case, yeah, I'd, I'd read the, um, the, the Shadows Built sketch because it, there's a transcript of it in the back of Charlotte Chandler's book, if you remember. Yeah. Uh, so I'd, I'd known of it and had always been intrigued to see it. And yes, yeah, that was the first time I saw it. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it is not, it's not just uh, useful and, 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 you know, valuable as a resource. It is a, it is a little film in its own right. Um, and it is charming and delightful. Um, a bit like it's a bit like the, the the film equivalent of Harpo Speaks in the way that that's both a, a peerless mm. Marx resource, but also a delightful book that people who know nothing about them and care less can still enjoy. Um, I, I think it's it's sort of analogous to that. Yeah, I was thinking in some ways too. It's a a a bit of a film version of Joe Adamson's book. So many of the points and themes, uh, the use of the Philippe Supalt quote at the end, even some of the specific clips used are moments highlighted yeah. by Adamson that, that aren't often cited elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, perhaps it's time to give our audience some relief and bring on some guys who know what they're talking about. The two primary... Finally. Yeah, it's about time. And none too soon, the primary creative forces behind the Marx Brothers in a nutshell, uh, as well as the later W.C. Fields straight up. Yeah. Before the name Robert B. Whitey was famous as the punchline to a million curb referencing memes, it was already famous among fans and students of comedy and film. Mr. Whitey's credits, besides his deservedly lauded work on Curb Your Enthusiasm, include Mother Night, How to Lose Friends and Alienate People, Mr. Sloan, and standard-setting documentaries about W.C. Fields, 
Mort Saul, Lenny Bruce, and Woody Allen, as well as, what does this say? The Marx Brothers. And the forthcoming and hotly anticipated Kurt Vonnegut, Unstuck in Time. We are delighted to have him here making his Marx Brothers Council podcast debut. Mr. Whitey, welcome aboard. Hi, everybody. I guess that covers everyone. (laughs) (laughs) And our returning champion... Last heard on the podcast way back in episode two, he is the man who wrote the book that changed my life, and I know many of our listeners would say the same, Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and sometimes Zeppo, a history of the Marx Brothers, and a satire on the rest of the world, crucially, is that rare work whose sentences run through your mind forever, even if you've only read it. 50 or 60 times. (laughs) And as if that were not enough, he is also the author of Tex Avery, King of Cartoons, The Walter Lance Story, and Bugs Bunny, 50 Years and Only One Gray Hair. It's a pun. As well as an accomplished director, producer, and editor. I've probably embarrassed him sufficiently at this point. Mr. Joe Adamson, welcome back. Hi, hi. That, That was very nice. Joe, your book changed my life, too. What I want to know is, could you change it back again? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's Woody to Saul, I believe. Oh, you know too much. <laughs> well, we usually ask uh, first-time guests for their Marx Brothers origin stories. And so, Bob, Whitey, that is, um, will you tell us, how did you first discover the Marx Brothers and get hooked on them and get interested in them? When I was in eighth grade, we had a uh, oh a special day at our school where it was called Any Year's Day, where you were supposed to dress up from any year in the past or the future, I guess. And I just got this inkling to dress up as Groucho Marx, who I was only vaguely familiar with from seeing maybe bits and pieces of the films on TV when I was younger. So I knew his general look and all that. And, you know, I had enough of a Groucho look to start with that I thought I could do this pretty well. So a couple nights before this day that we're all supposed to dress up, it just so happened that uh, KTLA channel five local station here in LA that played all the um, Paramount movies showed uh, the coconuts. And for some reason in the past, when I've told people about my, my first experience seeing a Marx Brothers film in full, I lie and I say it's duck soup and I don't know why I do that. (laughs) Just because Duck Soup would be the obvious one to see and say, oh, my God, I love these guys. I got to see everything they've done. Coconuts is kind of an odd film to do. So I just sort of make it a more obvious story. But but you're hearing it here first. The, the first film that really got me hooked was The Coconuts. Hmm. And I said, oh, I see how his hair is kind of parted in the middle and kind of goes out to the side. So, oh, it's a big grease paint mustache. Isn't it? It's not even real. And so I dressed up as a grad show. But seeing... Uh, the coconuts that night, you know, I flipped out. Talk about, you know, uh, having an experience that changed your life. That was it for me. And then before long, you know, what I remember what KTLA used to do is they would have a week, they'd sort of do a marathon of the Paramount films minus um, uh, Animal Crackers. This was pre Steve Stolier. So anyway, I just watched them all pretty short period of time and and fell in love and that was uh that was really it uh but uh you know i like many of you i don't know that i can uh, define what it was that just captured me so completely but that was uh that was it and then and then i wound up dressing up as groucho quite a bit <laughs> they sort of had the drop of a hat any excuse to dress up as groucho and then you start, <laughs> to, memorize, you start to memorize the lines and you throw them at people and and um, this is this is beyond the scope of the question that you asked, but I'll, I'll, I'll just say it quickly, is that I, when I was a freshman or a sophomore in high school, I guess a freshman, I'd actually written my idea of a Marx Brothers film, like a feature length film. And I met a friend in high school who was a couple years ahead of me, but he had a, a Super 8 sound camera, which was quite a novelty back in those days and cutting edge technology. And so we actually made my film. It was called Cracker Jacks with an X, which I thought had a, a nice Paramount sound to it. And um, I played Groucho and recruited friends to play Harpo and Chico. And somewhere in a closet, I've got a super eight uh, millimeter sound film of my of my Marx Brothers uh, 
epic. But I need any... to bring that out. <laughs> no, that's bring not... that out of the closet. Yes, we've we've all got to see it now. I'm sure you all have your own versions of that, be it on videotape or whatever technology was around when you were at that age. But um, it really takes a lot of arrogance to create a Marx Brothers project and then cast yourself as Groucho. Yeah. Come on. I mean, Can you imagine? <laughs> who would do something like that? <laughs> well, I'm sure it's better than Go West, whatever it is. <laughs> by, by the way, yeah, barely. Uh, now, of course, the films showed on TV. Uh, Channel 11 had uh, the MGM films. And then eventually you could see the others, Love Happy and Room Surface or whatever. But I was also very fortunate in that in Orange County, where I grew up, I grew up in Fullerton, gateway to Anaheim. Um, <laughs> Anaheim was the old movie theater on Harbor Boulevard across from Disneyland. And you could go and sit with a very enthusiastic audience in this intimate little theater and see these films on the big screen. So I was fortunate enough, even in the 1970s, the er early mid 1970s, to see a lot of the films for the first time uh, on a big screen with an enthusiastic audience. And boy, what a great way, even now, you know, it's great that we, if somebody had told me back then that someday I could own all the Marx Brothers films for $10 each, let alone on Blu-ray, which of course was far from existing. In, in, in better versions than were even possible. At, right. in, in the 70s. Exactly. But in any event, that was a great thrill. And occasionally I would come out to Los Angeles, which was like an hour's drive if I could make my older brother or my mom or an older friend who had a driver's license come out to L.A. because there are plenty of repertory houses and, and um, uh, special event screenings where you could see the film. So I, I was lucky enough. I may be among the last generation who managed to see a lot of, you know, those films, a lot of the Marx Brothers films specifically for the first time on the screen. Well, how about that, Joe? Uh, we interviewed you on this podcast so long ago, and some may remember it was under slightly underwater technical circumstances. Whoa, certainly is windy. Whoa. <laughs> Here's your Florida call, Mr. Whitmore. Florida call, Mr. Whitmore. Uh, you beat me to it. So, uh, <laughs> so how about you, Joe? How, how, did, how did you first encounter the Marx Brothers and realize that they were going to take hold of your life? Uh, well, I'll, I'll do it very quickly. If, if you know, Bob says Coconuts was his first film. Um, in my case, it was The Big Store, and uh -oh. in both cases, very unlikely, you know. But what happened was, uh, I was it was the late show, and I was watching it with both my parents. And Hollywood movies, you know, major studio films on television were when I was 10 or 11, that was a big novelty. That was a brand new thing. MGM movies were not on TV, you know, 12 months before this particular date that we're talking about. Uh, so all of a sudden, you could see a movie like The Big Store. So instead of Night at the Opera or Day at the Races being the first one I saw, it was The Big Store. And I, 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 loved, I loved it. I, and I, I liked them and I loved the characters and I enjoyed it. And as soon as it ended, First words out of my father's mouth. I mean, first person to say anything was my dad. And the first thing he said was, oh, they made a lot better pictures than that. <laughs> and I went, what? There's better pictures of that? You know, so instantly I had to see all of the others. It was really the MGMs I saw first. Well, since we're all gathered here this way, why don't we talk about the Marx Brothers in a nutshell? This story begins with you, Bob, Whitey. And the inspiration to create this documentary happened uh, just a few years after you dressed as Groucho for school. Yeah, that's true. I, I was out of high school, just out of high school. I would have been 18. I was going to Orange Coast College in Costa Mesa, California, and studying. They had actually a pretty good cinema program there for what was really a, a, like a junior college. And, um, and they had equipment, you could actually make films, and they had, you know, movieolas and all that. Um, so in any event, I was doing the, the different assignments for the class, but starting to think about how I might make a living or what I might do as a first project or a film that I might try to make. And um, I thought, well, how is it that nobody's made a documentary on the Marx Brothers? I mean, you know, aside from like, you know, Wayne and Schuster's, you know, look at the Marx Brothers or whatever. Nobody's really made a, a, an official 
you know, a definitive documentary in the Marx Brothers. So I decided I would like to do that. And uh, just so that it would exist so that I could watch it. And um, <laughs> uh, I had really no idea what was involved. I remember speaking to my instructor at Orange Coast College at the time and just saying, I had this idea that maybe I would try to do a Marx Brothers documentary and, you know, clips and film interviews. And, and he looked at me and said, well, it's pretty ambitious. You're probably talking about four years out of your life. I thought, four years? What are you, nuts? What's it take to shoot some interviews and, you know, get some film clips? Well, it was about four years later that the Marx Brothers in a Nutshell uh, actually got made. But um, so I was 22. I used to joke that if it had happened any earlier, my parents would have had to sign the contract with PBS for me because it would have been. I'd have to guarantee the lease for you. Yeah. Bob, Bob was talking to PBS before he turned 21. I remember that being part of it. That's true. I actually now a couple of years later, I wound up going to USC I took film courses there. I was not an accepted cinema major. I kept applying and kept getting rejected. So I went to USC as an undeclared major, took a few film courses available to non-majors. And there was actually a, a course there about how to get financing for a film, how to make a small independent film. So the Marx Brothers documentary, or let's say the proposal for it, the pitch, the treatment and all that, became my final project for that class. So from that class, I was able to walk away with an actual proposal to send out. And I sent it to uh, PBS and uh, they had a, a program fund at the time specifically to finance films or finance programming that would be used for their pledge weeks when they come out and beg for money. And uh, they had just done the, they had just done one on Fred Astaire Joan Healy and David Kramer, I think. They used to make a lot of those films for PBS, and they were very good. And the Fred Astaire documentary did very well for them. So I, I submitted this to PBS. Now, at the time, I was maybe maybe 20. And um, they got back to me, and they said they wanted to do it. And so then I started this arduous task of trying to get clips out of Universal, who owned the Paramounts, and... MGM and just couldn't get anywhere with them. They just didn't want to deal with me. They, you know, we can maybe let you have two minutes of clips for, you know, $5,000. I mean, it just, it was just crazy. So I actually had to pass. The first time PBS came to me and said, we can finance your film. I had to get back to them a little later and say, I can't, I can't get the clips. And they were actually pretty cool about it. They said, all right, we'll take a rain check maybe next year. Now, somewhere in there prior to that time, I thought, you know, who am I? I'm a schmucky little, you know, 19 year old or 20 year old kid with no credits under my belt. How am I going to legitimize this in the eyes of PBS to give me, you know, six figures to make a low six figures to make a film. So I decided to package into the production, other people who had experience, who had resumes, uh, who had credits. So the first person I went to was Richard Patterson, who had directed that wonderful film on Chaplin called the gentleman tramp. This is, pre Brownlow and Gill's uh, The Unknown Chaplin. Um, it was just an excellent film and Chaplin was still live at the time and he appeared in the film. So again, I sort of used my connection with USC to get to him. I had another class. I don't even remember what the class was, but I was able to manage for my final exam or my final, you know, thesis. that wouldn't be thesis because I wasn't going for a degree, but whatever, my, my final paper for the class was I decided to sort of trace the development and production and release of a documentary. So this was my excuse to go to Richard Patterson and say, hi, I'm a USC student. I'm doing a paper for a class and I'd like to follow the history of your film, The Gentleman Tramp, because I love it. And can I interview you? And he said, yes, he was very nice and very flattered. This was ostensibly my excuse to milk him for whatever information I could get about how to make a film like this. So here I got to sit down with this guy and say, tell me everything about making your film and <laughs> paper. Yes. But what I'm really doing is taking notes for myself to get my film off the ground. And Richard was very nice. And um, uh, somewhere in there, I said to him, oh, I think I finished the paper and I gave it to him. And he really liked it. And I said, Hey, can I ask you something? He said, yeah. I said, I'm trying to get this documentary off the ground about the Marx brothers, you know, probably for PBS. If I get the financing, if I get, the green light, would you be interested in signing on as director? And he's, I remember his answer. He said, yeah, well, you know, I'm interested in working. 
I said, oh, well, that, that works out. So now I was, I was able to package in this award-winning, you know, specifically biographical documentary film director into my film and use his resume to take, you know, the onus off of my lack of a resume. And then somewhere in there, Joe, was it Dave Stone? You know what? Yeah, I, at some point, I need to interject a prehistory. The reason I left Pennsylvania, where I was going to college already, and went all the way out to UCLA in Los Angeles, was to get into Hollywood filmmaking. They did have a program that George Seaton was running, and that's the reason I came out here. I got out here, and that program no longer existed. So now I was out here, and it was like, okay, now what do I do with my life? And I was I was stabbing around for another project, and I did not expect it to be a book on somebody else's films, but that's what it turned into. It turned into Groucho Hopper Chico and sometimes Zeppo being my master's thesis for a master's degree. And in that process, I, you know, I'm at a film school now. I got the idea of making this Marx Brothers documentary. And I had friends at the American Film Institute and I talked it over with them. And one of them said, you're never going to do that because you're never going to get Universal and MGM to cooperate with the same project. So you might as well forget it. And I did. <laughs> that's, that's as far as the thinking got on the thing. Um, and, and, and then the story picks up with Bob. Because Bob, whom I didn't know at the time, is, is now doing all this work in Orange County and contacting Richard Patterson. And he caught up with Richard Patterson when, when Richard was working as an editor at the Hanna-Barbera Cartoon Studio where my friend David Stone was working. So when I made films in Pennsylvania, Dave Stone was one of my collaborators. He's now the Oscar-winning Dave Stone. He was the sound editor on uh, Coppola's film on Dracula, Bram Stoker's Dracula. It's actually Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. But uh, Dave Stone was the sound effects editor on that, won the Oscar for that. But at the time, Dave Stone and Richard Patterson were working side by side when Bob Whitey is trying to contact Richard Patterson and Dave Stone overhears him. And he says, well, if you want to do a documentary on the Marx Brothers, you want to contact my friend, Joe Adamson. And Bob knew who Joe Adamson was. Yes, I, I came very close to stealing Joe's book when it first came out because I was a kid with hardly any sort of pocket change. And I heard nothing in advance of this book coming out. And I was already a full-fledged Marx Brothers nut and had every book you know, that was out there that I could get my hands on. And I was in a department store back in the day when department stores like Broadway and May Company all had book departments within the store. And I came across this new book on the Mark Brothers. It was thick and it was dense and had this interesting kind of silver and pink cover. I said, what the hell is it? Where did this come from? I've got to get this. <laughs> oh. Bob is, the other Bob is, oh, everyone's holding up their copy. Well, mine's way I, back there. And mine's in the next room. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I have some right behind me. Yeah, I'm sure you do. The original manuscript is right back. <laughs> uh -huh, I don't have that. We, we've all got that. <laughs> but, uh, in any event, so I, and I looked at the price. It was $10. Ten, I don't have $10. Where am I going to get 10 I have to have this book and I have to have it now. I don't have $10. That's <laughs> highway and, robbery. And I swear I started to look around me to see. This is before there were surveillance cameras everywhere, you know, pre-1984, both Orwell and, and uh, in actuality. I thought, I bet I could just like put this under my jacket and walk out with it. And then, you know, Better Angels took over and I said, no, no, don't do it. But I was desperate to get that book. And then soon after, I actually received it as a gift and read through it. And there'd been nothing like this. I mean, look who I'm talking to. I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here. I mean, it was just... Such a great book and funny and smart and information you never got anywhere else. And uh, it was just a great book. So that was it. I read it. So as soon as Dave Stone said, well, you've got to talk to my friend Joe Adamson. Frankly, I'd already thought of trying to recruit Joe to work on the film, but didn't know how to reach out to him. You know, this is pre-Google. And um, mm -hmm. so when Dave said, I said, yes, yes, yes. Put me in touch with, do you know Joe? He's out here in Los Angeles. I thought he was in Philadelphia. Yes, he's out here in LA. Although he'd rather be in Philadelphia. Uh, 
and that, um, that that's on my tombstone. Yes. yes. Uh, so so yeah. So we hooked up, and uh, I think Joe thought, you know, this smart ac- alecky little twenty year old kid, like, yeah, good luck to him. He's really going to get this film made, sure. And um, next thing you knew, he got a call from you saying, uh, uh, I- "I'll tell you very briefly." The, the, the film clip situation, which was the big hangup, I wound up getting a job. This was sort of this dream job where I was making $127 a week, which was big money. I could buy um, 12 copies of Joe's book every week if I wanted. <laughs> um, I wound up getting a job as a, a runner, you know, a gopher, an errand boy for Raul Joffe, who are Woody Allen's producers. And they managed not only Woody, but Dick Cavett and David Letterman and Robin Williams and Billy Crystal and Martin Short and in any event. So I got this job with them and somewhere in there, I was telling them, I was telling Charlie Joffe, the late great Charlie Joffe about my plans to do a Marx Brothers film. And he, I showed him the proposal, which I had. And he looked at me and said, well, this is great. What, why, why haven't you been able to make this? I said, well, you know, PBS is willing to fund it, but I can't get the clips that I need out of Universal and MGM. So he literally pushed a button on his phone to speak to his assistant, Linda, and said, uh, Linda, who's had a business affairs over at Universal? And she said, uh, that would be Arnold Shane. And he said, uh, get me Arnold Shane. <laughs> so she did, and he was on the phone. Arnold, I've got this fellow who's been working with me, a young fellow, great kid, very smart, loves the Marx Brothers, wants to do this documentary on the Marx Brothers, and you guys won't let him have the clips? What's going on? <laughs> Set up a meeting, met with Arnold Shane the next week, got the clips, did the same thing at MGM. I remember David Chasman uh, didn't have a meeting, but Charlie just over the phone talked to David Chasman. He said, just charge him a permanent fee and let him have the clips. So because of Charlie Joffe, I now had the clips. So I was able to go back to PBS and say, hey, I've got the film clips if you're still interested in the film. And they said, yes, we are. And the timing worked out that they're just getting into the next funding cycle. Called up Richard Patterson, called Joe Adamson, and said, "Let's make a movie." What, what What happened was I had a day job at that point, and uh, Bob called me up, and I had a phone right, right, you know, right where I was working, and I picked it up, and what I hear is Bob going, "I got my clips, I got my clips. Now I'm so happy, I got my clips." Did I really do that? I've it, done that that's absolutely what you did because I will never I forget. Try. <laughs> I will never oh forget God. that call because I was in the middle of not only trying to hold down this job, but I had a contract to do a book on Walter Lance, which finally did come out. But I mean, it was at the time something I was, I had a deadline for. And all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, we have to go ahead on this picture. Presumably that's something that's never got any easier over the years, is it? It's getting clips. I mean, one of the things that makes, in a nutshell, stand out now is it's pretty much the only Marx Brothers documentary, and there's now many, uh, that doesn't rely entirely on on public domain clips from trailers. That's right. <laughs> I, I will say this. The process of getting clips now tends to be much easier because I've done any number of documentaries that utilize clips over the years. And now, basically, the studios are sort of set up to just – charge you an arm and a leg. Um, you know, the fees are, can be pretty extravagant, but they are set up to license clips. And I think one of the things that happened that made the studios so um, stingy about letting other people have their clips was uh, That's Entertainment for MGM, you know, which was a big hit. And by the way, this is another podcast for another topic, but uh, That's Entertainment really turned me on to musicals, MGM musicals, which I did not like as a kid. And then I saw that film in high school and uh, it really turned me around. But in any event, that film was so successful for MGM that I, I this is just my own theory. I have no empirical evidence for this, but I, I'm guessing that the studio started to say, hey, there's there's some value in this old stuff. Why, why would we let somebody else take it when we can, you know, use it ourselves and make our own compilations and our own films? And um, I think that's, this was just in the wake of that. And I think that may have sort of informed their policies about uh, not letting other people have clips. Yeah. uh, I I think the studios now recognize that that's part of doing business. People are going to come after them for clips and it's easier to say yes. At the time it was like, just easier to say no. And uh, it took Michael Corda a year 
12 months to get uh, Universal and MGM to agree to let to let us quote Marx Brothers dialogue in Groucho Harpo Chico. That For was that was only moderately outrageous. Um, I don't think I don't I don't think they charged us anything. At least I didn't have to pay anything. Nothing came out of my pocket. But uh, they just were in the business of saying no at that point, and and now now they realize okay, it's better to have a department <laughs> and have people whose whose job is to handle that kind of thing. Also, I, I think they realized that they weren't going to do with their material what MGM did with that's entertainment. I mean, it's not like everybody started to dig into their libraries and and uh, create compilation documentaries out of their great films. It just didn't happen. So, you know, let other people do it, make them pay you, and then you reap the benefits to the extent that it might rejuvenate interest in these films or whatever. But um, anyway, it's a very it's a very different situation now. Plus, there's all kinds of fair use laws that under certain circumstances let you use the stuff without even paying for it. But that's another topic for a legal podcast. I would think once the <laughs> home video era began and people could easily, as consumers, just buy these movies, a documentary like that is virtually a commercial for the products they're selling. I mean, you would think sure. they would want the uh, exposure to the material. Now, one, one thing I'll say was that after this, you know, whatever, three and a half year buildup, from the time I first thought of the idea until we were actually ready to go. Once PBS gave us the green light on the second round, I think we had like six months to make the film or something. It was, it was not a lot of time considering that we were really starting from scratch. And the other thing is, you know, this is very antiquated technology by today's standard. I'm always marveling still at the, the beauty of, digital editing and what that means. You know, if, if, if I'm making a documentary now and I need a picture of whoever, let's just say Irving Thalberg, I could Google his name, come up with dozens of images, you know, find one that's high res enough. Even if I'm going to seek it out later to get the rights or whatever, or to get a, a more high res version from the time, I think I need a picture of Irving Thalberg. I can have one in the film in about 20 seconds. <laughs> that's literally true i've done that working on things like oh i need it and, and then it's it's in the cut it's in the cut in less than a minute and it's interesting too that we did this film when a lot of first person witnesses were still alive now you do a documentary on the marx brothers or you know anyone from that era you're lucky to get like grandchildren and biographers or contemporary performers who were fans who speak of their influence but we jesus we had a risk in it. if you're real lucky you get bob and me yeah exactly Yes, who have both now been in films and documentaries on the Marx Brothers. Yes. About the interviews, I'd love to hear the process of how you got people or maybe didn't get people you wanted. Uh, can you talk about that? Um, let, let, let me just say, just a, 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 as a, a precedent to this, Bob's idea to do on-camera interviews with people who were there is what made this film happen, I think. It, it, you know, Because my idea didn't include that. But that had come up since then, and that was being done in things. And so when Bob said, we'll do interviews with people, I, I think that's what made people say, all right, this, this could be really good. So who is the unseen interviewer in all those, in all those clips? Is that you, Joe? It's a combination of us. I did many of them, and Joe did some of them. But Richard, uh... Richard did one or two himself. And w when we interviewed Margaret Irving, we turned on the camera. Richard asked one question. And she just talked nonstop. And, and th they would get to the end of a magazine, have to change <laughs> magazines, put in the new magazine and start again. And she would just pick up where she left off, went through six or seven magazines, filled them up and said, thank you very much. And wrapped up and everybody was out of there but me. And she was still talking. She gave me good stuff, and I didn't even have a notepad out. I'm going, yeah, yeah, great, wonderful. Oh, wonderful, thanks so much. Oh, wow. I love that she's holding a fan. Margaret Irving in her interview is holding an old fan. It's very That's elegant. Right. Yes, yes. That, that, yes. Wasn't, that wasn't a prop. She was really using it. But this was a woman who was in her 80s who just wasn't used to people approaching her saying, we know who you are, we love you, we want to interview you and get these stories from you. So these stories have been she'd been holding on to them for 60 years or whatever. Hmm. And finally, somebody asked her about her life and her career and the floodgates just opened and she told all the stories she'd been holding on to. 
<laughs> she, she actually gave a lot of this stuff to uh, Hector Arce. And I think that's why Bob contacted her. Bob made all these connections, which is, you know, I mean, I know from doing Groucho Harpo Chico, that's quite a job. But Bob really did it for this for this. So a lot of project. letters, and phone calls, and a little bit of research to find out where these people were, and um, you know. Well, the the other thing I wanted to say was was that Bob says we had six months to do it, and we were starting from scratch. I would say we kind of were, but we kind of weren't. We were not on square one, thanks to all the work that Bob had done, um, and he, you know he had found these people, and interviewing them was just a matter of calling them up and saying, you know, that Marx Brothers project we talked about, we're doing it. When will we come over and and then shoot your now, interview? When I talk about six months, I'm really talking about physical production more than anything. Certainly the, the research and a lot of that legwork was done so we could kind of hit the ground running. But uh, six months is still not a lot of time to physically, you know, start and finish a film. I, I was, I was, you know, impressed at the time that, it took Richard Patterson and his friends two years to do Gentleman Tramp. And, uh, you know, I wish we had two years from the start of production, from the green light to completion, to have done Marx Brothers in a nutshell. Although Bob said we'd have ended up with basically the same film. A number of the interview subjects are, are people you had spoken to, Joe, for the book. I, I sort of assumed that that was one of the things you had brought to the project because you'd already, not all of them, but a number of the interview subjects um, had already spoken to you for Groucho, Harpo, and Chico. That's why I ended up doing a couple of the interviews because I, I, I had known the guys now for, for like 10 years. I, I, I knew George Folsey better than I knew Bob. And uh, when we got to that interview, Bob said to me, you know, I haven't prepared anything. Do you want to do this? Hmm. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I was the one asking George Folsey questions. But I had no prep for that. Do you think if Zeppel were still alive, you might have been able to get him? No. I, I told the story recently of what happened. When I was doing the book, I tried to get in touch with him. He was in Palm Springs, and I was in um, Westwood near UCLA campus. And I could have easily driven out there, and I asked him if, if uh, you know, if I could do an interview with him, and I sent him a, a return envelope, you know, a stamped, self-addressed return envelope, and all he did was write in the margins of my letter, "Groucho is your man. Get in touch with him," and sent it back to me. So that was that was my attempt to talk to Zeppo, and I. Now the thing is, had Zeppo still been alive? Bob would have tried him, and and that that that's the reason why the film finally got made was that Bob has a way that and the W. C. Fields film also. Bob has a way of bringing people together that start out saying no, no way, it's not going to happen. The one interview that really went south was the very first one, and it was with uh, Bert and Charlotte Granite, who were you know lifelong friends of I guess all the brothers, but particularly close to Groucho. And mm. it was my fault. I was a kid. It was my first interview. I didn't you know I was just a wreck and nervous about it. And my questions, I don't know if I were to play it now, it'd be very painful to watch. And um, uh, there, there was only like maybe one or two statements of Charlotte Granite that wound up in the film. I filmed them as a couple, but did, you know, singles of both of them and maybe some two shots in there as well. And you know, the interview with Burt Granite just wasn't very good. Again, my fault, not his. And um, also, as as you're ed editing the film and whittling it down to the really key stuff, a lot of things that you think might be usable suddenly fall by the wayside. So there's a bit of that, you know, the old cliche of winding up on the cutting room floor. So so Burt Granite wound up on the cutting room floor. Charlotte was in there for a couple of statements. And I remember it being a very uncomfortable thing to have to tell them that Bert wasn't in the final film, which is something I do to this day. If I'm working on something and somebody gets cut out of the film, I always let them know beforehand because you hear these stories from actors who go to premieres or whatever and bring their family and friends and then they're not in the film. You know, one thing we can talk about is uh, trying to edit Maury Riskind. Was there a problem? It, it just is a real job. I did an audio tape of him in 69 to do the book. And I recently, I never transcribed it when I was doing the book. I just 
wrote down the, the passages I wanted to use. I had somebody transcribe it just so I could work with the whole thing. And she called him the master of the false start. He, he never finished the same sentence that he started. And he, he would start a sentence and then rewrite it while he was saying it. And this is true of virtually every sentence, unless he said, excuse me, or something like that. Every other sentence would be something like, well, when I talked to Groucho, well, Groucho was like, you know, it was just constant. And A mind at work. A mind always at work. Yes, oh, that definitely that, and, you know, and, and a writer, so that as soon as he hears a sentence, he realizes how he wants to change it. But if you look at that segment of, of the show, every time he comes on, you'll notice we keep going to photographs so we can cover the audio cuts, because you make the audio cut, and the audio cut sounds good, but the video cut now looks awful. I assume you approached Susan, uh, Harpo's wife? No, Susan... Uh... Susan was still in pretty good shape back then. I can't remember. Uh, I certainly would have wanted to have gotten her, but maybe Bill, maybe once we got Bill, maybe Bill said, no, I don't think she's going to want to do it. She may have been a little too, not vain, but, you know, not wanting to be seen as, you know, at that age or something. There would have been a reason to. Yeah, I I, I think that I think that's it, Bob. I, I think that that's it? exactly what happened. Whatever it was, Bill kind of said, yeah, I'll be the spokesman, mm -hmm. you know. And by the way, I forgot there was one interview I shot that uh, never made it into the film. And that was with Betty Marks, Chico's wife. She was yeah. filming. The same day I filmed Maxine, I was in New York. I filmed Maxine and I filmed Betty. And, um, you know, Betty in some ways was still very lucid, but her hearing wasn't good. And her her speech was a little bit strained and difficult. And, you know, she was just, a, you know, it just wasn't a solid interview, and uh, so she wound up on the cutting room now. Well, 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 Bob and I found two clips that we liked, and we cut them in, and Richard didn't like them and said, I don't think you want to use those, and we, and we took them out. Yeah. It was a little sad. I know there was a run on the, um, on the uh, Facebook page recently about um, Groucho at uh, well, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion in, in Los Angeles, why hasn't that been seen? And the answer was, it was just too, actually somebody asked about it being in the documentary. Uh, and the answer was, it was just, it was just too sad to see Groucho in such poor shape. I mean, it, it wasn't terrible. He was able to perform, but just, you know, he'd seen all this, just come off all this great footage. You didn't want to see Groucho as an old man sort of stumbling through it. And it was the same thing with Betty. It just kind of, slowed the thing down but it was a great afternoon getting to talk to her and uh, i spent a couple of afternoons with her because maxine and i became very close so i'd go to new york i'd always visit maxine a couple times we went and visited betty and just one-on-one -on -one to sit and talk with her was wonderful but it just it wasn't good footage for the film the funny thing was i i wasn't there when he did this because it was done in new york and i was still frantically trying to put the cut together in los angeles but betty was still in the room when they interviewed maxine and so she's talking, and it, it, if, if you see the, the complete interview, all the, all the footage, Maxine will make a point, and Betty will, you know, agree with her or disagree with her quite vocally off screen. <laughs> and Maxine had to go, Mother, you've already spoken. This is my turn now. <laughs> <laughs> I do things a little differently now. Whatever is a current cut of the film that I'm working on at the moment, I always try to keep a reasonable length. I mean, you know, around two hours so that it's never too overwhelming. But with the Mark Brothers film, our first few cuts, or let's say our first cut, we just put everything in there that we conceivably would want to be in the film without any kind of, it's getting too long or whatever. This, we might use this. Oh, this is great. We might use it. Oh, this is a funny bit. So consequently, our first cut of the film was like a 15 hour cut. And my joke was that I'd have to change the name to the Marx Brothers in an immense nutshell. <laughs> and it was so long that it took like three days to sit and watch the cut. It took Richard three sittings to to actually go through the whole thing. But I, I did tell Bob the, the difference between what Bob is saying and the way I remember it is that that wasn't a, actually a cut of the film. That was an assembly. An assembly, yeah. 
Yeah. And so I'd like to don't... see the 15 hour version. Mm. Ken Ken Burns, Mark's Brothers. Yeah, it could have been a mini series. I, I I think you would. And there were some things in there that I think I think you know people listening to this podcast would have enjoyed. There were many. Let's put it this way: there were many, many, many more Groucho stories. The um, the the whole section on Harpo's character portrait was about 15 minutes. Chico's was about 15 minutes. Groucho's was three and a half hours. It was three and a half hours of people saying, well, I was at a dinner party with Groucho, and here's what he said. And Nat Perrin had a story. I, I talked to him after the picture. He was really ticked that his his story didn't get in. Well, there were so many Groucho stories that I remember. If you if you look at the film now, there's a clip of George Fenneman saying, In fact, there was a woman standing behind us at the Brown Derby in Beverly Hills one afternoon. We were waiting for our table for lunch. Very attractive woman. And he turned to this perfect stranger and he said, Are you alone? And she said, Yes, I am. And he said, Well, there must be something terribly wrong with you. And at that point, you, 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 know, you, you pretend you're not with him. <laughs> well, that like takes about five seconds for him to say. He tells it very well. It's two laughs. And that enabled us to eliminate I'll take a glass. Six or eight <laughs> six or eight other stories that were all like, you know, all seemed to go on for five or ten minutes to lead up to one punchline that you might find funny and you might not. Well, I assume you had promised or directed to keep it around 90 minutes or so. Uh, I'm guessing that nowadays they'd be thrilled with something a lot longer, if only to uh, hawk as a home video perk. There's there's no question that this could have been a miniseries. Yeah. And again, the, the, the pocket of money that PBS used to finance this was specifically used for their pledge films. So people now who have, say, the DVD... You know, it runs together as one film, but it was actually constructed with act breaks. So I, I think it was, I think it was, it was a three or four, Joe, three or four acts of the film. There were only three. We had four for W.C. Fields for some oh, reason. Right. That's right. It was four for Fields. So there, there actually, it was in three, it was, you know, a three act show with these breaks for the pledge. And then we'd come back and, and resume. But, you know, once it was put on DVD, it was all. You uh, still have all the unused footage. So. It's not too late to do that 15-hour cut that we'd all like. Yeah. It's it's at the UCLA Film Archive, isn't it, Bob? The, the footage was actually donated or put on deposit with, with UCLA, although God knows what that even means now because it's really, I guess, like cut together, taped together work print and the negative. So even if you went there and said, I'd like to see the Betty Marks interview, I don't know what means they'd have of showing it to you. <laughs> who knows if they even have that's always the problem with archives just hold it up to a light bulb and just I mean, pull frankly, it really I'd love to get all that stuff digitized and the thing that's frustrating to me now when I look at the film again this was the best technology that was around at the time and we always made a big effort to get the best clips we could get and I remember things like the house that shadows built clip which really hadn't been seen or maybe one been seen one other thing before we used it and um things and, like and they that. didn't know what it was yeah right they went, here's a marx brothers scene god knows what this is you right. know as soon as i saw it i knew what it was out of the opera trailer with the brothers in the mgm logo there's some things we got directly from the studios uh they were like fine grain 35 millimeter prints and that was great but i remember with horse feathers we had kind of a substandard 60 millimeter print, which was still the best you could get at the time. But I look at the film now, both in terms of the interviews and the film clips, and boy, I just wish I could go back and digitally remaster everything and really clean it up. Bob did remaster it in 2002, and I just looked at the remastered version last night, and there were some surprises in there for me, because I thought, you know, 99% of the time I was watching my own editing. All of a sudden, I saw something I'd never seen before, and I realized I never ran that that DVD. I've sold several of those DVDs, you know, since since Bob started making them. But uh, uh, he tweaked it when he remastered it. You you, you added a couple things, as, as as you may remember. You're looking at me blankly right now. <laughs> I, I don't remember. In fact, the I, I remember the guy who is actually selling the DVDs, the distributor put that remastered on when and technically it was because I think I went back to an earlier generation of the one inch tape 
to, to master off of that. And it said expanded cut, but the only thing the expanded cut was the Woody Allen footage was put back in, which I'll explain briefly for those old yeah. enough who remember seeing it on PBS back in 82. I'd filmed an interview with Woody Allen. You know, it was, again, it was, the film was almost finished before we shot the interview. So we were cutting his stuff in towards the very end. And um, so the agreement that I had with him, you know, cause he's so publicity shy and doesn't want the publicity for any film that he's in to be banked on his name he said, I'll give you an interview, but don't, don't use my name to publicize it until I've had a chance to see the film, sort of sign off on it, and then you can include my name along with everyone else's, so long as my name isn't highlighted. And I said, fine, that was perfectly reasonable. Mm-hmm. What happened was shortly before the film was locked in, in fact, I take it back, the film was locked and delivered with his interview. PBS had leaked his name to like TV Guide. And TV Guide had this thing, you know, Marx Brothers and Netflix, Woody Allen, blah, 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 which was a violation of the deal I had with him because he hadn't seen the film yet. I didn't have time to get it to him yet. So he was very polite about it, but had his manager, who was Jack Rollins, whom I worked for. And um, so he made it clear he, his agreement was broken and you're going to have to take his footage out of the film. So it broke my heart. I had to go into an an online house and take our mastered one inch and literally cut his clips out. And then years later, once I did the home video or DVD or whatever, I went back to him and said, Hey, you know, is there a chance that I can put your footage back? And he said, yeah, sure. You know, cause that was so long ago. It was water under the bridge. And well, know. also he said it was PBS. He was really mad at, he wasn't mad at Bob. Yeah, he made that point that he he basically didn't want them to get away with because the terms of the agreement I passed on to PBS and they just ignored it because they got excited that he was in it. He made it clear he it was nothing against me. It was PBS. So consequently, for the home video, PBS having nothing to do with it, he was, you know, he was amenable to putting the footage back in. So that allowed us to say expanded cut. So, I, you know, any other kind of editorial changes that that you didn't know about, I can't imagine what those would be, but. Well, I, th- th- there's two things, and, and people might be interested, but when we show the still of Humor Risk, that's a production still of, of Humor Risk when it was in production. Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Zeppo are all in the still, but they're hard to see because Groucho, Harpo, and Chico are out of their makeup. And uh, so now, if you when, when that still comes on and it says the Marx Brothers you know, made this too real comedy, their images are highlighted. Oh. That that highlight was not in the original version. It's much better with that in. But I'm just saying, I, I kind of jumped out of my seat last night when I saw it because I had never seen that. I'm, I'm, I'm glad the changes I made behind your back were for the better. I don't remember every tiny little trivial crazy thing like you do, Joe. <laughs> Well, you know, you, I, I brought up something when, when we ran the show last night. There's a clip from Mother Goose Goes Hollywood, a Disney cartoon, where you see Fats Waller at the piano and uh, Harpo is inside the piano. Get away from me! What's the matter with that piano? The man's crazy! I think it was Mother Goose Goes Hollywood, right? And we knew that scene was in the film. And we went. I went to Disney and said, can we have a copy of the film to find this? And they sent it. And it was just cut right out. We said, you know, what's going on? And clearly they cut it out because it was just an uncomfortable kind of racial stereotype of Fats Waller. It's not PC. Right, exactly. So what was interesting was not only did they cut it out of the film, they just denied it ever existed. Like, we don't know what you're talking about. It's a scene of a, no, no such scene like that in this film. Yes, no, there was. You cut it out. No, we didn't cut anything. Oh. Fine. Joe had a cartoon collector friend, and he had it. We used it. We never paid Disney because they denied owing it anyway. If they came to us and said, hey, that's our clip, we'd say, no, you told us there's no such clip. So thank you. And we, we put it in. Actually, Bob, you cleared it. You, at least that's what you told me. I wasn't in on that conversation. But you said, okay, if we find that there is such a clip and we get hold of it, do you have any objection to our using it since you don't acknowledge that it was even in the film? And, and they said no. So we, we, we were basically in the clear. 
That may be. And, and we never had any problem with it, did we? No. I got to say, my favorite part of the show was all the great uh, newsreel footage, you know, at the pool with the families, uh, the soapbox derby stuff with Jackie Cooper, uh, and especially Chico and W.C. Fields hitting on the ladies. You know, how did you know this stuff even existed? I, 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 th I, think, I think I can take credit for that because I knew when they set up UCLA Film Archive, they got all of the studio prints from Paramount and 20th Century Fox. Well, 20th Century Fox meant nothing to the Marx Brothers. But the Paramount stuff included the house that Shadows built, included that scene, which baffled everybody else. But as soon as I saw it, I knew what it was. Um, but it also included some short films called Hollywood on Parade. And nobody knew about those. Those were not mentioned in any film histories that I knew of. But all of a sudden, they're right there and you can look at them. And so I knew those things were there. And I said, hey, Bob, we should we should get those. They're right there at film uh, UCLA Film Archive. And we got them with no sweat. But that's some of the footage that's new to the Marx Brothers fan. We were really concerned about the fact that we were just showing all these scenes from Duck Soup and Night at the Opera that Marx Brothers fans virtually knew by heart. We wanted to have something in there that they had not seen before. Yeah, as I was saying earlier, that's part of why the show is so good. It, it has something for everyone, the, the novice and the hardcore fan. And, you know, that's easier said than done. Yeah, that was sort of the agenda that, you know, yeah, we sort of cover both sides of it. People who knew very little or nothing about them and people who, you know, could recite all the dialogue from any one of their films. So, yeah, there was some effort that was made to find stuff that hadn't really been seen. And of course, now it's just amazing. I sound like some old geezer. You kids today, you don't know how easy you have it. <laughs> the stuff you can find on YouTube is just astounding. You know, almost everything is there. But this is, you know, back in 1981, 82. And, you know, it took some effort to find this stuff. And you, you couldn't do all your research sitting on your ass. You actually had to get up and go out the door and go into places and go into libraries and go into people's personal collections and sit and look at stuff. But, you know, it's a pleasure. I've always said the reason that I've, that all of my documentaries have been about my sort of personal heroes and personal obsessions is because if you're going to spend that much time researching something, you know, and, and, and putting that much, um, you know, blood and sweat in, into any kind of project, you know, it's, it better be something you really love because, you know, there are worse things than, you know, having to go to a library and sit all day and, you know, read things about the March brothers or look at March brothers footage. So it, it you know, sort of. What struck me, I, I watched it again earlier today. Um, the thing I think that comes across most strongly about it now uh, isn't, uh, that that wonderful array of of rare stuff because if you're a if you're a hardcore Marx Brothers fan you you you're familiar with most of it now, but is it's just the the, the, now, the yeah. very very beautiful and and that, and I do mean beautiful way the way that it's made uh, in particular the the montages of each brother that that are, that are, each one begins with the barrel. Um, the the way the clips are edited in, the way they're juxtaposed with music, particularly in the Harpo one, where um, the the soundtrack is his uh, "Why Am I So Romantic" um, harp solo, but the, it's it's showing footage of him walking down the stairs. So it's a kind of a, a, a high comedy moment, but it's got this gorgeous romantic music in the background, and it works so well, and it makes such a difference that it is it, you know it is it is a film in its own right. Yeah, that, that, that was, that, that's a definite carryover from my original idea. We had several meetings, Bob and Richard and I had several meetings in Bob's apartment. And um, Richard came up with the idea of coming up with ideas and, and writing them down on three by five cards and throwing the three by five cards down until we had enough three by five cards, we could put a script together from, from the three by five cards. That was a nice idea. But about all that came out of those meetings that ended up in the film was the idea that we should have character sketches of, of Groucho, Harpo, and Chico, as, as well as Zeppo and Gummo. And, uh, uh, and, and, and Bob's idea that Margaret Dumont's introduction should be a tilt up a photo of her, this grand imposing figure and, you know, arriving all the way up through some kind of nice gown that she's wearing up to her face. And, and those two ideas were about all that came out of those meetings that I remember. 
Can you talk for a minute about how Gene Kelly uh, became narrator? Because uh, he's not usually somebody you would associate with the Marx Brothers. Well, there, there, there was a point where we were considering Jimmy Stewart, and Bob said to me, PBS would like us to use Jimmy Stewart as the narrator. Could you live with somebody like that? And I said, well, the first year or two, we might have our little squabbles. <laughs> <laughs> but then that's inevitable, don't you think? I think I just put together a list of people who, who might be good. I, I like the idea of somebody old Hollywood. And, yeah, Jimmy Stewart was on the list. Um, I remember even uh, Lauren Bacall's name was on the list. I thought that might be interesting, have a female voice. And, you know, um, and it was just, you know, we got turned down by a few people. A few people weren't available. A few people were dead. Um, and uh, we're just using that as an excuse. <laughs> Then it was wider. Um, <laughs> you know, my first idea was to have Cavett narrate it. Uh, you know, Cavett was doing a lot of those kinds of things. And PBS actually said, no, don't use Cavett because we have the Cavett show. He's very visible on, on the network. And at the time, you know, Cavett was going to be in the film as a talking head anyway. So they said, let's get somebody who people aren't used to hearing. And I put Gene Kelly on the list just because I'd heard his narration of some other things. I loved him. I loved his body of work. I loved those MGM musicals. And, you know, there's no real connection between him and the March Brothers, other than they're all MGM players, or maybe at different times. But in any event, I thought he might be good. And Richard and Joe signed off on it and approached him. And he said, yes. So it wasn't a sweet enough for getting the MGM clips. No, no. Totally <laughs> Did you work with Kelly in the studio? Yes, we did. I mean, I, I sort of sat back and let Joe kind of direct that voiceover session. And uh, we were about to wrap up. And, you know, he was sort of getting up to get ready to go. And Joe just had this afterthought where he thought, oh, there's one piece I don't feel he quite nailed. I wonder if we can get him to go back and just redo this one cue. I said, well, Joe, it's now or never. He's grabbing his coat. He's going to go. So Joe went into the room with Gene Kelly and said, I'm so sorry, that was all great, but is, is there a chance that we could have you redo that one cue? And Gene Kelly looked at him for a second and then extended his hand and said, shake my hand and tell me you're sorry. Ooh. <laughs> Whoa. It's very funny. I later got to know Gene Kelly's widow. <laughs> She's much younger than he was. And um, I told her that, that story, Joe, and she really laughed. She says, yeah, that's Gene. Very cooperative, very professional. But when he's done, he's done. And he's, you know. He was done. And and when, when I heard some of the things last night, Bob and I were watching the show once. And, and there's a bunch of rhetorical questions at the end, you know. Why had they proved to have a durability far beyond most of their contemporaries? Why were they able to make people love them by exhibiting the most antisocial characteristics possible? Why were they able to make millions identify with actions that seemed to make no sense at all? Bob's comment when he heard Gene Kelly reading these lines, he says, why did Gene Kelly attempt to say every sentence with a single intake of breath? Which, <laughs> which is what, what is happening there. But, but yeah, if you listen to some of those readings, I had a list of things I wanted him to do over. One of them is when he referred to fun in high school, because fun in high school has that funny spelling, and it was that way in the narration script. You know, high school is H-I-S-K-U-L-E. So he decided to read it in a funny way. Fun in high school. <laughs> you know, and I didn't want that. Just say fun in high school. And there were several mistakes. So one of them was uh, we knew we had the, the things in there where Zeppo was referred to as the funniest of the Marx Brothers. So when we talked about Gummo, we said, you know, Gummo was considered the funniest of the Marx Brothers, too. And instead of reading it that way, he read it as... A, and he was considered the funniest of the brothers, too. As if that was a brand new idea. So I, I wanted <laughs> him to redo that line. I, I had a list of lines I wanted him to redo. But Richard and I were in, were in the room with Gene. And Richard was the director. I was just the writer. And I just said, can we do this again? And he said, shake my hand and tell me you're sorry. So I shook his hand and told him I was sorry. <laughs> I didn't know that was going to be his cue to leave. It looks like this is my cue to leave. And, and it was, I mean, he was gone before I realized, I mean, he's out of the building before I realized what had happened. Yeah. So there are pluses and not minuses. We feel ultimately there was net gain because there were some lines that he just really nailed perfectly. 
When conversation now turned to the Marx Brothers, the word satire was invoked. Comparisons were made with the inspired nonsense of Edward Lear and Lewis Carroll. And it was not unlikely for someone to bring up the word art. My policy now, when I work with a narrator, is just never to compromise because it'll haunt you throughout entire production and years later. Oh, why didn't I go back and get him to do this? So now I'm not at all shy about doing it, but you do it along the way. You don't move on to the next cue until this one is done. And then you move on because I, I never want to deal with that again of wishing that I'd said something and gone back or pushed for one more take. Now I just, I, I get it. I'm uncompromising on that. Mm -hmm. I compromise on everything else, but on that particular note, Stanley Kubrick uh, has said the same thing. He says, you, you know, you're right there with, with the person. You don't want to hurt their feelings by saying, I really need you to do this kind of reading. I want, I, you know, but if they make a mistake or they do a thing that isn't quite right, you have to live with that the rest of your life. And that's true. You know, Bob when, and I are still living with everything that happened on Marx Brothers in a nutshell. Well, if you can call that living. But I, uh, when when Robert De Niro narrated my Lenny Bruce documentary, I actually gave him line readings in the booth, and he was up for it. He said he said fine. Uh, so I thought, well, how, how is it that I'm giving Robert De Niro line readings? Something <laughs> something's going terribly wrong here. Did he say, "Are you talking to me?" Well, that's another story. I tried to get him to say it. I wrote it into the narration just to catch him by surprise. And that's another story. That's when you do your uh, Lenny Bruce podcast. <laughs> your Robert De Niro podcast. Well, let me ask you this. And if I only had one small criticism of the film, and I'm guessing it was related to the time restraints. Well, I said you can ask questions, not hand up. <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? It's just it's just obvious that you quickly went through the end of the film career. I mean, not even mentioning a night in Casablanca or uh, Love Happy. Was that because of a rights issue on the clips, or did you just want to get past that period? I don't think so. I think we just felt, you know, once we had sort of dealt with the origin story and got them to peak and then, you know, MGM and then Thalberg dies at that point, rather than say, okay, and here's a clip from Go West and here's a clip from Nutter. We just felt it was sort of time to, and, and Joe, you're, you're, you'll, you'll get five minutes for a rebuttal here. But I, from what I recall, we just felt for the sense of pacing and we wanted to get onto some of this cool TV stuff that people hadn't seen. And also the film could only be so long, you know, that the point about their film work had been made. And we didn't want to show clips to illustrate that the films weren't as good now, because who wants to see that? So we just, and by the way, I don't disagree. I look at the film now and I can see how someone could look and go, well, wait a minute, hold on. There are more films. Where'd they go? How come you're not talking about Love Happy? But, you know, again, now, if you did this for Netflix, you could do the three-part miniseries. I think you'd include all that stuff. And, and by the way, we even had access to Deputy Seraph, which had just been discovered in somebody's garage while we were making the film. And I, I called up the owner right away, or the son of the owner, said, can we get this stuff? He said, yes, we were very thrilled to have it. I actually did something I learned not to do, which is I paid for it before our cut was locked because I was so certain we were going to use it. And it was for me at the time, a lot of money. And then in the cut, again, we had it in and, you know, we had that clip in at the end of the incredible jewel robbery where Groucho walks on stage. We won't talk and see our lawyers and the duck comes down and the film felt finished at that point. And then to go back, however, they got that together one more time and there were old men and it was really uncomfortable to watch. And it was, <laughs> here's the story behind it. And this is why you never, and then we thought, uh, so part of me wanted to play BT, you know, PT Barnum. I used to say, and say, you're seeing it here for the first time, but editorially, once we looked at, it, we said, this has got to go. So in a, you know, less, drastic example. I think that's how we felt about the later films. It was just, you know, we get it, we get it. Let's move on to something else instead of seeing clips from films they did in their waning years. Joe, is that sum it up for you or am I missing something? Do I only have five minutes to rebut that? <laughs> well, I'll talk about the cutting room floor. You can talk as long as you want. <laughs> um, the way I remember it is, is a little different from that, but I think what, what Bob just said is the rationale and 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 that works 
because uh, the sort of we had told the story, but in in reality, trying to do the whole thing in six months. I mean, we were squeezed right at the end of it, and and there was like no time. You know, there was no time to do anything. Um, the the night at the opera and day at the races only got transferred from 35 millimeter to videotape because the guy at MGM said, well, you guys are going to make the deal. You're going to do this. You might as well go ahead and transfer these two. And and so we had those in the cutting room Um, when it got down to the last week. So there was no time to go back and transfer anything else. And the deal was not made. The actual deal allowing us to make the film, you know, the deal with the Marx Brothers lawyers, was not made until I think after it had already been shown in Los Angeles. Uh, so, you know, there was no time that we said, okay, the deal's all set. Can we get uh, at the circus so we can transfer Lydia or, or anything like that? There, there just was no time. Uh, we were just lucky to have night at the opera, day at the races and the trailer to the big store. We really did not want to go have to go through all of those films and go, Oh God, you know, <laughs> maybe this is kind of funny. Maybe this will work. Uh, it, it it really would have been a whole new stage of working, which you know we'll have to wait till the uh, miniseries is done. But the the the, the story that I recall with uh, Deputy Seraph was that Bob and I, Bob and I did a lot of this between the two of us, and and Richard was busy editing. Um, American Cinematographer magazine. So basically, Richard's job became, you know, he's credited as director because his contract said he had to be. But basically, he became the senior advisor because he had made a film like this and Bob and I hadn't. But Bob and I would kind of, we would get together and make a decision and then move on it. And then Richard would say yes or no. And he tended to say yes. Nine times out of 10, he said yes. But we made the decision on Deputy Seraph exactly what we were going to use where we were going to use it. Um, Bob went and got it transferred. I cut it in and Richard saw it and he said, uh, you don't want to do this. And Bob was really unhappy. <laughs> and he thought Richard and I had conspired against him for, for, a, for a short while and later came back and said, why did I ever think such a thing? You know, but I mean, you know, emotions run high when you've got a deadline and you, you've already shot past it by about two weeks and you're still trying to finish the damn thing uh but that's that's how i remember it there, there was a there was a thing i w- wonder if bob remembers how, how this went because the original deadline was like the end of january and at one point early in january it became clear that the whole show was not going to be done by the end of january by january 28th whenever the date was and uh you know, the presenting station was KOCE. Oh, wait. It was actually KQED in San Francisco. KQED in San Francisco. The guy had come from KOCE. And, and, and so he was up in San Francisco. He was there. We had Bruce Shaw in Washington. And Bob was in touch with him. And he said, uh, and, and they just loved us. And they loved the idea that we were going to do this show. And they were going to have a Marx Brothers thing to show. And... So Bob said, you know, I don't think we're going to be quite ready by January 28th. Oh, that's okay, boys. That's okay. And uh, we realized we weren't going to have it ready by January 30th either. So he called them again and said, I don't think it's going to be ready by then. Oh, that's okay, boys. That's okay. Because it was, you know, way ahead of the broadcast date. And uh, this happened several times. I mean, they just so happy that we were doing this and and they loved us. Um, But there came a point where Bob said, yeah, we're not going to have it ready by February 12th or whatever the (laughs) new date was that had been set. And it was obvious we weren't going to have the whole show finished by that point. And it wasn't okay. So it really was a lot of last minute scrambling to get. It was, it was madness at the end. As I (laughs) I think about it now, we went from like the offline, literally grabbing the, you know, edit list and running to online and working around the clock. And then from there, literally just walking out of there, catching a plane, going up to San Francisco, doing, adding the credits or whatever, and then whisking it off to, to Washington DC to PBS headquarters where they made their copies that they had to make. And then it aired like a, a couple days later. I mean, it was really that 
compressed at the end. And I remember I was a, I was a wreck. I remember waking up one morning, the house that I was living in, uh, having gotten, I was like on three hours sleep. And I went into the, to the bathroom and next thing I knew I was on the floor. I just passed out. I was so exhausted. And it was just that kind of insanity. And then in the middle of all that was this business of having to cut Woody out too. Yes. Yes. That may have been what, what really pushed it over the edge. When Bob said he was heartbroken that he had to cut Woody Allen out of the film, that's an understatement. Yeah, that was that was a bad day. <laughs> yeah. Was that your this is a, a bit of a sidebar, but was that your first uh, association with Woody Allen, Bob? Yeah, although uh yes, no, it definitely was. Now again, just by coincidence. I wound up working for Rollins and Joffe, as I said, and they were instrumental in helping me get the film clips and all that. But I had actually already been in sort of the first round prior to the, you know, the PBS thing. I'd already been to Jack Rollins and gotten letters of, you know, sort of tentative agreement for both Woody Allen and Dick Cavett to be in the film. And, um, and then it's just a, absolutely a coincidence that I wound up working for them. So once the film got made, it was easy enough just to say to Jack Rollins, Hey, I'm ready to do the interview with Woody. And we set it up and I filmed him in the Rollins Joffe office in, in New York. And um, yeah, that was really my very first connection with him. I was very nervous Two two people. I was very nervous to meet because they were such heroes of mine. And I just didn't want to say something stupid or to come off stupidly were Woody Allen and then uh, Kurt Vonnegut, uh, both of whom I wound up becoming very close friends with. And, but that day interviewing Woody, again, a, a terrible interview on my part. And as you probably have gotten the idea already, I, I can be pretty long winded and I would ask Woody Allen a question. And instead of keeping it simple, the question would go on for three minutes. And there was a thing that always made Joe and I laugh where I asked Woody Allen this question that just went on and on and on. And he's kind of looking at me, looking at me. And then finally I finished the question, this long rambling monologue. And then Woody says, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not certain what the question is. To which I said, yeah, neither am I. Let's move on. <laughs> so, Did he have that smile frozen on his face like in Annie Hall when he's listening to that comedian? <laughs> yeah, sorry, how long can I keep <laughs> And then I would run into him occasionally at some kind of a screening or some event. We had so many mutual friends and Mort Saul was a mutual friend in Cabot. And so we always had something to talk about just in a social, Oh, have you heard from Mort lately? Or, Oh, I saw Dick last week and blah, blah, you know, that kind of thing. That was it. And then, you know, many years later, it was 2008 that I wrote to him about, you know, proposing a film on him, which I had actually tried to do twice before. And he'd always very politely turned me down. But when I went to him in 2008, I cajoled him enough to get him to agree to do it. So I made that film. And now he and I have remained very much in touch. Well, there's a question. I know that uh, both of you probably would be unlikely to want to repeat yourselves, but uh, despite the excellence of uh, Marx Brothers in a nutshell, uh, it's been almost 40 years. What are the chances that either or both of you would return to the subject and make a more robust Marx Brothers documentary or one with the technical sophistication uh, of your more recent documentary work, Bob? No, I think I'm done. <laughs> Plus, you know, the the the... the, the the difficulty in making these films is getting them financed. I'm finishing now my Kurt Vonnegut documentary, which looks like it's actually going to make it into theaters next summer, 2021. There's a distributor on board. We're working out the fine points of the agreement. Um, I approached him about the film the same year we finished the March Brothers film. This is in 1982. And he agreed to it. And it's been you know, basically financed out of my own pocket, you know, running around trying to get somebody to finance this and nobody would do it. So not every film is that difficult, but um, it's, it's raising the money for these things. That's tough. But I'm, you know, again, I'm, I'm not a kid anymore. I was 20, I was 22 when the March Brothers film was finished 18 when I started and um, I have to be very careful about what I devote my time to now. And, uh, That's true. It's, it, it, in watching the show last night, I, I, I jumped when Dick Cavett said 50 years from now. 
in 1982, he's saying 50 years from now that the year would be 2032. That's only it's only 12 years away now. And Gene Kelly saying they did their best work a half century ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, think, I regret uh, that. One <laughs> That's a lesson to me that I've utilized since is to not to put anything in a film that places it at a certain period of time because it becomes dated. You hmm. hear Gene Kelly say they did their best work over half a century ago, and it's like, yeah, way over. <laughs> <laughs> Dead for almost half a century now. So I, I now know not to do that. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. That was your piece of narration. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take credit for that, yeah. Actually, speaking of that Cabot interview, um, I don't know if this is just me, but does anyone else agree that it's it's one of the most visually... Uh, it's, the, 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 there's this wintry scene behind him and rain streaking down the window panes behind him. Lots and lots of rain. There was a storm. There was a storm going on. <laughs> Very poetic. It was a mm. hurricane. I mean, it was national news. I was in Los Angeles, and I knew they were having a hurricane out there at that time or something. Yeah, it was like record-breaking cold weather. It was like well below zero. I want to say like 12 degrees below zero or something. It was just shattering records. And in the middle of all this, because Cabot had, he had a place in the city, but he had a place on Montauk, Long Island, sort of famously, Um and uh, so he said, yeah, come up to Montauk. We can film the interview there. We can't do it at my house, but there's a place called the Gurney's Inn. You can stay at the Gurney's Inn. We'll help you get the reservation. And we can film the interview there. So I had to trudge out to the very, very tip of Long Island in the middle of this <laughs> terrible, terrible weather. But I put him in front of this window. And, yeah, there's a whole other story going on outside. You see snow. You see rain. <laughs> you see, uh, uh, you know, cats and dogs. And, um but yeah, I, I always like to look at that interview too. Dick and I are still very much friends. And I will occasionally let, I'll say, remember when we met and we did the March for the film? And you say, yeah. And then I'll say, you know, that was 15 years ago. And then that was 20, that was 25 years ago. That was 30 years ago. And then he's just like, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I love his story with the Jewish family and the girls and him searching for the word. Uh, they enjoyed the daughters. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very genteel. Looking at the film last night, uh, it occurred to me, th the Woody Allen interview, and that, uh, that was done the same day as the Dick Cavett interview, right? Or the same? No, the same. it was Ka Woody was done the day after Cavett. But it was the same trip to New York. Yeah, yeah, sure. And that was January. Our deadline was still January 28th or something like mm -hmm. this. And, and Bob is out there still filming interviews. And Maxine Marks was interviewed in December in New York. This is all the very end of the of the project i i had i had the thing the, the the editing was quite well along before he even interviewed betty and maxine so it's it's like a major major part of the of of, of the content of, of of the interviews came along right at the end you know uh maxine maxine marks dick cavett and woody allen that they just they, they just really are, are the icing on the cake as far as I'm concerned in terms of the interviews telling us things that we, that we didn't know and, and, and phrasing them very well. Also, everybody who knows Bill Marks, and a lot of us do, know that he's a lovely, lovely guy. And, and he and I have remained friends, and I, I, I adore Bill. And he was a lovely guy back then, but there were attorneys who got involved who were real sticklers, making things very difficult for us. There was an attorney who handled sort of the Groucho Chico estate, I believe, and another attorney who handled the Harpo estate. And they were not making life very easy for me. Uh, they actually- wound They're up still not. <laughs> oh, is that true? I'm, yeah. I don't doubt it, yeah. And uh, they, were, they, made, they were more difficult than really the lawyers for, for the studios to get the clips. But in any event, Bill sort of at the suggestion of his attorney, when we filmed his interview- Bill said, I have to hold on to the film until the deal's done. Physically hold on to the film before it was even processed, you know, uh, you know in a closet, in the film cans in his closet, and would not let us have the footage. Now, certainly I must have agreed to this before we filmed the interview. I don't think he snuck it on me as a surprise on the day. No, 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 no. no that, that was understood before we went. Yeah. So we filmed the interview. He held on to the footage. If I brought this up to him now, he'd be very embarrassed about it. If he remembered it at all, I doubt he would. Um, but in any event, so 
so even that footage wasn't available to us till the very last minute. And I finally did, you know, the producer thing. I said, Bill, sorry, we're at the point now where if we don't get the footage right away, you're out of the film. Now, you know, the film is going to get made. If you don't care that it's made without you, fine. But it's all going to be a moot point after Tuesday or whatever, because we're already past the line where there's no going back. And I think I had the film in my hands the next day, had a process transferred to video and then cut in. But again, that was another major interview that didn't actually get cut into the film until very close to the end. We, we had a line of narration that said, uh, nobody really knows what uh, fun in high school looks like, but we think it might've looked something like this. And then we had the clip from, from Horse Feathers. Um, and we were not, none of us were happy with that line of narration, but it stayed there. And it was in the film for a long time. And when Dick Cavett said, I'd give anything to see their vaudeville act, what it could have been like. I'm sure that some of their film work gives us an idea. We said, ah, now we can take that line of narration out and put this in. And that happened very late, you know, in the process. But, uh, you know, you could see it served, this, it served the, the function of introducing that clip. There's a lot of that. It's one of the things that keeps this documentary so rewatchable, even for those of us who know it well and who know all the clips and information well, is all the all those kinds of things. The smart edits in it, Cavett cueing the horse feathers clip as an example, using the California gag from Animal Crackers to illustrate the transition from the New York films to the uh, Hollywood films. Uh, Maxine, in her interview, was talking about Chico's. Uh, pioneering of the participation contract and then going right to the negotiation stuff from Animal Crackers. Um, you know, all of that is so wonderful. The film just kind of flows that way. Um, are there any things, are, are there any things that didn't make it in that were those kinds of uh, smart edits or transitions? Yeah, I, I have some, I have a, a whole riff on that because Bob several times in, in the making of the film decided to, pass along his theory of editing this thing to me, which was, you know, when it comes down to the end, if it comes down to a question of, shall we leave in this funny moment or shall we leave in this touching moment? I'm not so sure I won't, wouldn't go for the, the touching moment. And he said that several times. Well, it never comes down to anything like that. What it came down to was we had a two hour cut and we had to get it down to 90 minutes. So a lot of little little I call grace notes came out of it. One is the, the really the biggest one is Norman Kresna. When he tells that story of Groucho at the stock market, the whole point of that story was this is not typical Groucho. Typical Groucho was his being very serious and making serious comments on things. He says something like this happens. He says, I tell that story all the time, but I mean, if he did that kind of thing every day, he wouldn't have lived as long as he did. You know, uh, that was the point of his telling the story. But when I discovered we could cut from star marker went up 10 points. I don't know why they didn't keep Roger there permanently. And we could go from that to I'll do anything you say. In fact, I'll even stay. Um, I, I made that cut and we lost the whole point of having <laughs> the stock market story in there. Um, when Maxine talked about them in vaudeville and she said you know why did that get a laugh in des moines and it didn't get a laugh in detroit and why did that get a laugh in louisiana and it didn't get a laugh in georgia you know they'd find out why they changed things around and the audience would tell them what was funny okay that's in the picture what she said after that was a comment on vaudeville she said it's an interesting process which is gone and you know that was that was great we loved it but in fact, it's not necessary to tell the story of the Marx Brothers, so it had to go. So it was that kind of thing that had to go. But the funny thing is, Bob and I still use that line for each other. One of us will tell each other what we're doing now, and and it always ends with, it's an interesting process, which is gone. <laughs> it always <laughs> kills the other one. Um, but what is, Joe, what is, Joe and I can have entire two-hour conversations using nothing but inside jokes that are so inside, I don't even get them anymore. <laughs> Just today, we've been, we've been on a good behavior. I'll tell you a favorite moment of mine in the film is uh, the end of the Harpo sequence where, is it Mary Eaton who's crying? And Harpo takes out the big lollipop. and I think, I think, yeah. 
and, and, and licks it and hands it to her. And she just looks at him, looks at the lollipop and then holds on to him and cries. I mean, that's just a great moment even from the film, but the way that wraps up the Harpo sequence and the, and the, and the harp music comes to an end at that point is still, you know, just a moment that you look at and say, okay, well that, that works. Mm, definitely. Well, it has been an immense treat to have both of you here. There's literally nobody better to talk about this film with. And we are now in our third year of this podcast. I'm actually surprised it took us this long to get to such an essential work as the Marx Brothers in a nutshell. Wait, wait, we forgot something very important here. What's that? What did Jay Hopkins do? Why was oh, yeah. he... <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Why have you thanked that old reprobate <laughs> in your credits? <laughs> Probably... Gave me a couple of photographs or something. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there. I mean, Stolier is credited. Uh, you know, a lot of these people under special thanks, these names that still mean something to people who follow the, the council on Facebook. Um, in, in most cases, somebody found a film clip or gave us a photograph or something. I'm sure Jay had a couple of things in his collection that he loaned us. Mm-hmm. And John Tefteller is in there, too. Tell, yeah. Yes, tough teller. Well, it's interesting because John and I met in high school, and I don't know how. I don't know if he'd remember how, but somebody must have said, oh, my God, I know a guy who's a, as big a Marx Brothers nut as you are, because we didn't go to the same high school. We were in neighboring towns, but not even the same town. And somehow we connected. We were very, very tight friends back then. And he got married, moved to Oregon, I guess, right? And um, I think that's right. Yeah, we just we just lost touch uh, just because years go by and you know you lose touch and then you know through Facebook uh, we're we're connected again. And yeah, I, I I talked to John uh, recently. I, I guess I'm the one who's most uh, familiar with John right now because because we talked a couple of times. He was at a Cinecon that I was I was at, and uh, he's he's been great and and we've been uh, in, in touch. He, he's a very good guy. Yeah, we're all Tef Teller fans. Yeah, we're trying to get him on the podcast, but he's not exactly Bill Gates when it comes to technology. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, let's uh, let's before we wrap up, let's tell people how to buy the DVD. I'll, again, I'll give my piece, and then Joe will have his rebuttal. <laughs> 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 I would suggest to people that they go to www.duckprods.com. What is Duck Prods? It's short for Why a Duck Productions, which is my production company which has a website, duckprods.com. And on the homepage, you'll see a little thing. You can order the Marx Brothers, WC Fields. Give it a click. Both of the films are there. It's, you know, lickety split, PayPal, push a button. You're good. And I ship the next day. Now, if you order from Joe, you got to write him. He's got to look for a stamp. He's got to find an envelope. Deposit a check, you know, but go ahead, Joe. Well, well, the only rebuttal I, I can make to that is that if you buy it from me, it'll be the same disc, but I will autograph it. And uh, uh, the well, that where you would, the value. <laughs> where, where, where you would go is uh, two eight three six four South Western Avenue, number four oh seven in Rancho Palos Verdes, California nine oh two seven five. So if you want to mail a check and wait for Joe to get the check <laughs> deposited with the stamp, get it from Joe. If you want to push a button, it's on PayPal, it ships next day, you get it from me. The choice is yours. <laughs> but Bob won't even autograph it. So well, I'll autograph it. If so that's it. your choice. I'll reiterate in case we didn't get it in the can before, uh, just what a pleasure it is to have both of you gentlemen here discussing your work. Uh, we hope you'll both come back and join us for future subjects as they arise. And sure. Well, let me, let me say something either on or off the record. First of all, it's a pleasure meeting all of you guys. And the other thing is, it's a great service having the Marx Brothers Council Facebook page. I mean, it's just, it really is like a little family and it's just an example of how, you know, technology is neither good nor bad. It's how you use it. But this is one of the advantages of, you know, internet technology is that Marx Brothers fans from all over the world can go on this page and post things and comment and interact with each other. And it's the kind of thing that, you know, when I was a youngster pre-internet, you can only dream about. And it's just, it's wonderfully done and, um, 
it, it really is a great place to, to meet and exchange ideas and trivia. And uh, I just, you know, every, every day I look forward to going on the page and seeing what's new and what people have to say. So, so thank all of you or among you, whoever's, you know, mostly behind the page. I, I think it's a, a, gr- a great service for us uh, Marks fans. Thank you. That, that means a great deal. Yeah, I, I, have, I have to say the same, and I, and I think it's a tremendous thing you've done, Matthew. I mean, I appreciate uh, uh, Bob and Noah, too, but Matthew is the one who set this up, and, it, and it's great. And uh, Facebook has come under a lot of criticism recently for many things, and, and maybe deservedly, but there, there are some things Facebook does right, and I think the, the Marx Brothers Council is one of them. Thank you very much. Three chairs for Matthew Coney. <laughs> <laughs> no one asked for chair. <laughs> well, before we wrap up this episode, we just have a couple of addenda to previous items, follow-ups from episodes past. First of all, in our last episode, uh, talking about the alternate lyric in Lydia the Tattooed Lady, when she stands, the world gets littler. When she sits, she sits on Hitler. I wondered out loud in episode 25 if that rhyme had ever been employed by Mel Brooks. I could think of other examples of songwriters who have used it, but he's the one most likely to have used it, and I couldn't think of a specific example. So friend of the show, screenwriter Scott Alexander, decided after hearing it that the best person to ask a Mel Brooks question to might be Mel Brooks. Hmm. He called him to wish him a happy birthday on his recent birthday, and he asked him about this. And Brooks confirmed that he has never, in fact, rhymed Hitler or Adolf, but he expressed his admiration for the cleverness of Yip Harburg. And so thank you so much for that, Scott. And uh, there you have it. Mel Brooks has now been on our podcast. (laughs) The 2,000-year-old Marx fan. Yeah, That's right. (laughs) Um, And aren't they all? (laughs) so that's one and then we also have a follow-up also interestingly perhaps sent to us by someone named scott uh history professor scott sandage rhymes with bandage by the way i've been advised who corresponded with us earlier about the one more sweet curio uh Mm -hmm. mystery in room service professor sandage has been listening to our past archive And way back in our Day at the Races conversation, uh, we had expressed our puzzlement about Groucho's, what I called a sleeveless lab coat, or at any rate, a very short-sleeved lab coat Mm -hmm. in the examination scene. And why? Why is he wearing that, we wondered and, and giggled about. Well, turns out that veterinarians, specifically country horse doctors, tend to wear short sleeves because their job often involves reaching into the nether regions of the equine. <laughs> In fact, the thing that I called a lab Isn't coat, that how Go West was written, by the way? <laughs> 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 yeah, it's called a veterinary gown. And in veterinary supply catalogs to this day, you can find those short-sleeved things that Groucho was mm. wearing. So it's a joke, and I guess it would have been a familiar joke to anyone who's ever had their horse adjusted. <laughs> so thank you to Professor Sandage for that one. I'm yeah. reading his book right now, by the way, Born Losers, A History of Failure in America. It's very interesting. A cup of coffee, a sandwich, and you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, from the opera, I reach into the back of a horse. <laughs> And I believe Matthew also has an item to uh, throw on the pile here. Yes, I have a a request for information on behalf of uh, two listeners to the podcast who are called David and Jeanette Waite, neither of whom rhyme with bandage. But they have a question about the, uh, the collision of Groucho and Sherlock Holmes. Now, as we know, uh, there are a number of occasions when uh, Groucho and Sherlock Holmes almost uh, shook hands with each other. There was an offer in 1941 for Groucho to appear in the William Gillette Sherlock Holmes play. Uh, there was talk also in 1941 of, a, of a, a Sherlock Holmes vehicle for all three brothers. And uh, George Kaufman wanted him to appear in a stage pastiche about Sherlock Holmes. So there are one or two uh, links already, but uh, David and Jeanette 
wanted to know if it was the case that Groucho appears in the 1950s Sherlock Holmes TV series, the one that you can see on YouTube or get on $2 DVDs everywhere because it's public domain, the one with uh, Ronald Howard as Sherlock Holmes. Um, and the short answer to that is is no, he's not in it, uh, not least because although it was an American production, it was actually filmed in France. So the chances of him getting there are very, very Slim, but they said that they definitely heard some connection between that production and Grad Show. Uh, I did a bit of web searching and thought I found the answer when I found that one of the online uh, DVD shops that was selling it um, listed Grad Show as, as the main performer. So that was obviously just an error, just some, some bit of inputted information wrongly had just ended up on this website. So I very confidently went back and said that was the answer. They then said, no, we've seen a report from the 1950s that actually says Groucho is going to be appearing in this series. So I throw it open to all you good people. Uh, can you find any reference, please, to Groucho going to appear in the 1950s Sherlock Holmes TV series with Ronald Howard? The gauntlet has been thrown down, friends. Well, that brings us down to the end of another one. Thank you, as always, for listening. Already? Yeah, we could do the whole thing again. Should we go back? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a real treat for you. You know, we always end the show with a piece of music that is somehow thematically appropriate. Well, this time, uh, for the first time, Joe Adamson and Bob Whitey are going to sing. Take it, boys. <laughs> <laughs> Dear heart, at night, dear heart, for you I pine, for you I pine, in all my dreams, in all my dreams, your fair face beams, your fair face beams, you're the flower. Brothers Council Podcast is hosted by Matthew Conium, Noah Diamond, and Bob Gassell, and is produced and edited by Bob Gassell. If you enjoyed the show, please show your support by leaving us a positive review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast provider. Matthew Conium's books, The Annotated Marx Brothers, and That's Me, Groucho, The Solo Career of Groucho Marx, are published by McFarland. Noah Diamond's book, Give Me a Thrill, The Story of All Say She Is, The Lost Marx Brothers Musical, is published by Bear Manor Media. Both can be found at major book outlets. Please visit our website at marxbrotherscouncilpodcast.com. Also look for us on Twitter. And for the place to talk Marx and meet fellow fans, join us on the lively Marx Brothers Council Facebook group. This is Heidi Gassell. We'll see you next time. By, by the way, I should say this. Matthew, you're the sort of the, the genius behind the page. Bob, you're sort of, you're the, is it you and Noah who sort of co-do this uh, podcast? 
Bob is really the editor and the main producer of the well, podcast. Then who the fuck are you? <laughs> <laughs> I've been wondering for years. He's the face. He's the face. Yeah. But on one Broadway show and suddenly uh, you're... <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing here. He's the photogenic one. <laughs>